So, uh, let me go back to the beginning. Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to our um, hybrid <laughs> panel. We are here in person. Um, and we are also here online. I'm not letting in, actually, let's not let in otters, please. Sorry, I, I do not like AI. Uh, AI is not our friend. You heard it first here. AI and direct democracy do not mix well. That's the only lesson you should take away from this entire uh, meeting. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. Obviously. <laughs> okay, so my name is Yvonne, and um, I um, am I am the um, director of Solidarity Research Center. We're a worker self-directed nonprofit, and um, we've been around for about ten years. We started initially as the research arm of the Industrial Workers of the World, the Syndicalist Labor Union, and. Um, yeah, we're really excited to be here. Um, we're sort of rubbing our project, the Municipalism Learning Series. Um, and we, we are, I'm joined here by three of our lovely uh, Municipalism Cohort Fellows. Um, and that's the thread. Actually, if you could go to the next slide, please. That's the thread that connects um, all of us here. Um, we, um, so we, the, the four of us on the panel met through the Municipalism Cohort Fellowship. This was a 12-week fellowship that we ran last year to basically introduce concepts of radical municipalism, direct democracy, and dual power to grassroots organizers across North America. So we had about 26 people, organizers from the United States, from Canada, and Puerto Rico, um, go through this kind of like learning, thinking and learning and applying um, program. Um, and so, um, to introduce the four panelists, so, um, so we are joined, um, by Allison. Um, so Allison comes, uh, Allison is based in, um, Puerto Rico and San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, and Allison, um, teaches at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, she is a weaver that connects multiple, er uh, diverse er arenas. Um, and strives to strengthen movements for just transformation. So she's an engaged neighbor, volunteer, um, an advisory board member on a food sovereignty project, a mother, a friend, a sister, partner, and colleague. Um, and uh, she teaches in the School of Urban Planning. And uh, I'm actually looking at an old bio, so I'm not, that's not all there right now. Sorry, I'm a researcher. I'm a researcher. Um, and we are also joined by Kermit, um, who is an abolitionist researcher and writer and a fourth generation Philadelphian writer, dreamer, uh, who's researching and organizing at the intersections of land, food, and environmental justice. Okay, that's good. Um, and he's based in Philadelphia, and we are also joined by Dizzy. So Dizzy is an educator, longtime community organizer, and helpless rights advocate. She grew up in a family that worked as counselors and educators in um, a slum on the outskirts of Nairobi, Kenya. Um, her early experience in working with the dispossessed community compelled her to pursue higher education um, in the U.S. and eventually work with youth as a high school science teacher. Okay, well, I'll just say really quickly, because I'm so proud of you. During the pandemic, Mindy started a mutual aid network um, called the Palm Gun House Mutual Aid Network, which does incredible work in our city. Um, and she also co-founded the Angeles Workshop School, which you will all learn more about, which is like a radical pedagogy um, and, uh, and like unschooling kind of uh, school. Um, and then there's me. I, I think you've already heard about me, so I don't need to go more, but I do live in Los Angeles as well. Um, and then last, I just want to say, um, based on the experience that we all had um, in like going through the process, how do we build power in place? We are going to be, we are collectively producing a municipalist organizing toolkit, which we will release um, in on July 6th. So our program on July 6th is a public panel that is targeted towards grassroots organizers. We will also have another panel 
for more broader audience audiences on September 17th, which is the anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. Um, so without further ado, actually, if, Kermit, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just to review the agenda, um, so we, we just ran through welcome and introduction um, and the thread that connects us all um, around the concept of municipalism and dual power and direct democracy. Um, and we'll each do a presentation for about 11, 10, or minute, 10 minutes or so. We are going to break up into triad. So we had a brainstorm over lunch, and uh, we are going to try this 5D model that Kermit has created <laughs> to uh, organize our conversation, um, centering commons. And, uh, and then we'll have Q&A and then closing and appreciation. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, the, the sort of like visual representation of the trajectory of this panel is that I will start us off talking about the sort of experiment to build an alternative polity and economy in Los Angeles. And that has um, a thread of the concept of self-governance um, or polycentrism, as I'm hearing here. Uh, and that, that connects to the work that Disney does in, wait, in terms of um, you know, doing self-governance in the sphere of education. Um, and then Kermit will talk about the work that he's been thinking through, which is linked to climate resilience and the sort of like disaster kind of analysis that and, and uh, that um, Allison is doing. So I just wanted to provide that visual, which Kermit actually created. Um, all right, so uh, let's, yeah, next slide, please. So, you know, I think that happens when my computer might be um, unactive for a while. Um, Okay. Um, okay. Can can folks on Zoom here? They said the sound is echoing. Maybe are you on mute? Uh, are you on mute, Ivan? Mm -hmm. I'm mute. Then. Yeah. Okay. So um, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about the experiment that we've been working on in Los Angeles. How bad is the echo? I think it's the right side of the microphone. You might decide to talk. Okay, that. so actually, I'm close enough to that, so I don't need it. But can folks in the room hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Great. Wonderful. So um, I'm going to talk about the experiment that we've been doing in Los Angeles for the last three years now. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So we are a project, Los Angeles for All, of um, Solidarity Research Center. So just to give some context, um, Los Angeles is a ridiculous city. It's like a, a absurd city. Um, we are a big city. We have over 500 square miles. We have almost 4 million people. And that was just from the 2019 data. Okay, so actually we don't have 400 neighborhoods. <laughs> people define neighborhoods differently. So if you actually go by the LA Times, we have over 100 neighborhoods. But still, we, we, we were very big. Um, most of us are tenants. We're housing precarious. We also have, um, this is also an outdated number. We have, you know, probably at this point, 70 to 80,000 people that make their home in streets or RVs or, you know, on people's couches. Um, and, you know, um, almost a quarter live in poverty. And with all these people, with all these problems spread out over 500 square miles, we only have 15 city council people that represent us. Um, and that means that each city council person represents over 250,000 people. Um, whereas um, in a place like New York City, they have 51 council members representing um, at least about 150 constituents, 150,000 constituents each. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So what, what we did is we, we were birthed um, Actually, like we sort of preceded the debacle that happened, the scandalous debacle that, um, you know, kind of like, scan it was just like scandalized our entire city when there was a leaked tape of a back room conversation that three city council people had with a labor leader uh, last 
it, it was uh, October of 2022. <laughs> you get older and like the years kind of blur. Um, basically where they were wheeling and dealing on redistricting. And they were also, you know, making extremely anti-Black comments, anti-Black racist comments about political power and the consolidation of their own power. And so this was extremely scandalous. Um, in the preceding spring, we created this decentralized network of autonomous social movement organizations in the city. So we, uh, we include uh, Dindy's group, Palms, Unhoused Mutual Aid. We have other mutual aid organizations like Mar Vista Voice, uh, Street Watch, which I think is starting to get back active again. Mm -hmm. A lot of mutual aid in our city is based around um, organizing with unhoused people, mostly to prevent sweeps from happening, uh, to prevent what um, Ananya Roy calls racial banishment from happening. Um, we also have um, within our network people that build alternatives. So um, eco villages, land trusts, cooperative developers. Um, and we also have people that build power, like tenant unions, um, abolitionist organizations. Um, and then people that reimagine institutions, just like the public bank. So next slide, please. Um, and so we have three assumptions that go into our organizing project because this is essentially this is essentially an experiment. Um, yeah, I think. Oh, there we go. Yeah, what it is is like that's what it is. Okay. So, so we have three assumptions that go into our experiment. The first assumption, if you can go to the next slide, is that. So we understand that social movements have ebbs and flows. So social movements are not static with the same level of energy, you know, throughout the continuity of time. You know, there's upsurges in the social movement, like we saw, we all saw that. Now, I mean, just a couple of like, I, I actually don't know where we are, but there's an encampment. And I heard you guys have snipers at some point. Like, but anyway. So there was there's an upsurge. There continues to be an upsurge. It's a very exciting moment. Many people are being politicized and entering into our social movement. And mostly today. We'll see their how we um, and then there's a period of disillusionment and sort of low energy. So just we understand that this is the case. We take this into consideration. We also know that people go through these cycles as well. There are cycles of extreme energy and excitement, and then like you know, in bitter, <laughs> unfortunately. But it's kind of like, so we keep this in mind. Our second assumption, if you can go to the next slide, is that um, we take seriously the theory by, um, we take seriously the theory by um, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. Um, can folks on Zoom hear me now? Yes, they can. So we take, okay. So we take seriously that, you know, based on the research that they did by compiling a database of various social movements over time, you know, they calculated that, I mean, this was actually not their main reason for doing that database. They were trying to make a point about whether nonviolence is actually an effective, you know, uh, method to, you know, change society. But, you know, inadvertently, they also stumbled upon you only need three and a half percent of a population that were very engaged in a social movement to, cr to create a regime change, essentially. Um, and now this has been picked up by, you know, a lot of folks, including Extinction Rebellion, and there's a lot of healthy debate about this. But this is helpful for us because we're not going to organize 4 million people. We'd love to eventually, <laughs> but we, we're, we're using this. And then if you go to the next slide, um, we also recognize that Social movements, the form of social movements, which is a word I have not heard uttered at all in the past three days here, by the way, um, that we have taken on this shape of decentralized distributed networks. So if you look at the civil rights movement, oftentimes there was a, a key institution or leader that, you know, sort of had ideas and then issued, you know, ideas for it. Uh, and then since Occupy, since, you know, Black Lives Matter, it's become a lot more decentralized. There are multiple nodes, like the encampment. There's there's no central authority. There's multiple centers. It's, might, might you even say polycentric, you know? <laughs> so next slide. So our hypothesis is that LA is ready for our municipalist moment. 
And what we mean by that is that we are ready to build an alternative polity and economy that is directly democratic. Uh, we believe that everyone should participate in decision making. Now, obviously, if there was a fire in this building, I do not want to sit and have all of us going around and, and say what we think should happen. Like, no. But like, I think when it comes to like, how should we allocate resources that benefit all of us? There's no urgency. Like, we can figure that out together. Um, and I, we believe that this new system should eclipse the current system of capitalism and rule by the power elite. And how we're going to get there is this idea of dual power. So we are going to build alternatives wherever we can, and we're going to fight to shrink the status quo until we can transition power and resources to the alternative. So it's like a resistant build and a model. So if you go to the next slide, please. So these are the different strategies that and, met, and tactics that we're using. In the short term, we're involved in the effort to reform the charter of their city so that we actually expand our city council so that we're not stuck with 15 people that are beholden to real estate developers um, and that we have independent redistricting, you know, we encourage more participatory budgeting and other types of non-reformist reforms. Do folks know what non-reformist reforms are? What is it? Gentlemen with the beard? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to gender you. No, it's all good. Uh, so the, my understanding is it may be incomplete. Um, wait, so, wait. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so my understanding is that the idea of non-reformist reforms has largely been advocated by uh, prison abolitionist organizers uh, who are concerned that some reforms re-entrench existing systems of power. So the idea that, for instance, if you build a women's prison in order to make women in prison safer, that prison will get built. So that's a reformist reform, whereas a non-reformist reform would be one that, while it's a reform mediated through the existing system, is conducive to an eventual goal of abolition. Do I have that broadly correct? Yes. Yeah. And then there was this dude, Andre Borg, that talked about it a lot in his lens as well. So, but yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we're basically going to do non reformist reform, things that will serve us in the short term, but not harm our ultimate long term goals either. Um, and then long term, we are also doing political education. We are doing people's movement assemblies. Um, we are trying to return the common that is singular. There's apparently a difference. Um, and, you know, practice prefigurative politics. And then that will overall lead to a just transition. So next slide, please. So we've also been, as far as, you know, this conference goes and thinking about how do we dem directly democratically organize ourselves in such a way to, like, think about things like the management of the commons for the better, for the good, for the greater good. We've been studying different models historically. So we've been looking, for instance, at a syndicalist union called CNT in Barcelona and how they you know, were organized at the local level and then confederated to scale up to represent the entire country, ultimately. Uh, next slide, please. So the People's Movement Assembly in Los Angeles has been studying these models over the uh, since September, I would say. We've also been looking at the new structures of local governments that the Zapatistas are trying to um, you know, uh, realize, again, there's like very like deep local organizing, which then gets confederated, you know, to, to, to reach a certain scale. Um, and then next slide, please. Uh, we've been looking at Barcelona and Camus, which are very good friends of ours, uh, which similarly drew upon the practice of neighborhood assemblies in the Catalan area, uh, but then used it to construct a people's platform, which ultimately elected a municipal mayor in 2015. It was a direct outgrowth of their version of the Occupy movement, the Indignados, um, Ada Calau. Uh, and so again, they have you know, a structure that you know, also depends on territorial groups at the neighborhood level. Uh, next slide. And we're obviously also good friends with Cooperation Jackson. That's a huge influence on us. So thinking about how Jackson, you know, structured their people's assemblies, they are very ambitious. They try to get 20% of the population engaged. I'm not going to do that to myself. <laughs> so we're shooting for three and a half, but, you know, then they put, you know, they, they bring people in 
and they, they have leadership. It's not structureless. You know, there is a form of structure and uh, collective governance. Uh, next slide. So, um, yeah, so one of the things that we're in the process of doing right now is adopting this uh, model of sociocracy, which is a directly democratic, collaborative form of governance that came out of the housing cooperative movement, but is now being adopted by the solidarity economy movement and a lot of worker-owned cooperatives. I serve on the board of, a, of an organization called the New Economy Coalition, which is a national network of you know, groups that are trying to grow alternatives, and this is how they sort of run themselves. But we, we are very, very intentionally also trying to cultivate deep organizing to build a base, because we need to start at the level of the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. I think that's it for me. That's my contact information. Uh, okay, so next we've got Cindy. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dindy. I put up the three kind of things I'm involved in right now that um, are relevant for this conversation. I'm actually not going to talk about Puma, but if you're interested in what an abolitionist network of care is, you can just catch me later and I'll talk your ear off about whatever aspect of it you are interested in. I am, however, going to discuss um, kind of three models. Next one, please. And um, these are programs and schools kind of built um, on people power uh, through community demand and in confrontation of neoliberal kind of state, the public school statement, and as a response to state abandonment. So all of these are grassroots projects that don't so much have anything to do with the public school system anymore. Um, these are questions and contradictions that I raise for myself, we raise for ourselves within um, kind of these three frameworks. And so instead of trying to work my way through each of them, I'm just going to put them there. And then if those are of interest uh, for you to discuss again, when we have q and I'm happy to do it. I will say um, all of these are very much interested in having an outreach kind of perspective, a network reaching out um, a to community versus a recruitment model or trying to get people in or coerce them into whatever. And also um, all of these three models also really actually as assume that education for everyone is important, necessary, and that um, we're not anti-public schooling basically is what I want to say. And there, there are a couple contradictions that might come up for me as I, as I discuss this. And then also everyone always asks, um, so how do you scale these things up? And I'm going to really talk about it more in a how do you scale out type of a way. Next one, please. Okay. And so um, I am Los Angeles based. Um, I've been involved with these three projects. I'm only gonna talk about the first two very briefly. The first is called Escalita es Aslan. And it's a very small school that emerged out of community organizing group called a Union del Barrio that came together in the 80s in San Diego along the border. So it was, uh, it's a community defense organization. It's, a defen um, it's an organization to support migrants. And so what happened is within the, the group of organizers, uh, communities came together and they said, first of all, we can't afford these so-called summer programs in San Diego. We want something for our students to do and you must do something about it. And so this is how Escalita Aslan was born with a very kind of conscious effort to have a small summer school program that for, focuses on youth building up um, their consciousness, organizing, actual, doing actual things in the world and thinking about their own liberation as young people and for their community. And next one, please. Um, I'm not going to read these, but these are, this is what the kind of the curriculum that emerged out of that original community demand. And this is what students wanted and their families wanted. And so we essentially made curriculum um, uh, thematically around those uh, principles. And that community demand was, um, as you're going to learn, I'm going to spend more time talking about like what we actually do, because I find people want to know that more than they want to discuss the abstract philosophy and all the modeling that brought us to this point, if that's okay. Although I'm happy to pontificate about that too, but I won't. 
Um, and so um, they were very much interested in schools like Black Panther kind of liberation schools, um, what we see in the South in Mississippi in the 50s. There are other schools that kind of model this kind of consciousness building in places like uh, Brazil, uh, North Africa, and kind of co-ops and collectives all over the world. And next one, please. And um, there, there's always this conversation as uh, um, the, the folks in the, in, at Escolita who are mostly Mexican, but also people with indigenous roots. So there's always a question about relationship to land and also relationship to public space as people who are deeply dehumanized by their, their state and criminalized. And so um, I don't know how it works here, but in Los Angeles, you can have a neighborhood council. And if you want to beautify your neighborhood, they have all of these little projects and you as an individual go to the neighborhood council and you pay for the right to like paint your mailbox, you know, beautify it. Um, we absolutely rejected this model and the students are like, we're just doing it. We're gonna take it over. And that's actually what happened. And I want to mention that because that was a huge um, part of the general ethos of this, that we're, people are no longer asking permission. And what happened, um, this happens to be in South Los Angeles, is these were not vandalized. No one put graffiti. They really are and still remain kind of community fixtures. Uh, I'll talk very quickly um, about Colegio del Pueblo. This is an ethnic studies uh, collective group. So after we had Escalita, um, the parents started to demand this as well and um, demand for, for classes of this type to be taught so that they could have conversations with their own um, children within their homes. And so, um, after a couple of my um, comrades were teaching like theater classes and that kind of thing within their own classrooms, uh, next one, um, parents started to demand what we ended up calling like parent ethnic studies or Colegio del Pueblo. And it kind of eventually moved from being kind of a teacher led thing to a parent led thing. And it moved from what um, the public school was offering at the time, which was you get a space to teach citizenship classes or you know English as a language, uh, second language or type of classes, kind of how they, they have those community classes. And actually what the community said is, um, that's great and all, but that's not our focus, next one, or what we're interested in. And so these again are the topics, themes, and ideas. Um, and that's a group of, our first kind of group of teachers who were kind of interested, and these were the things they were interested in. Um, um, the two teachers who were involved in this ended up actually being fired by the school district because what happens is the parents now start demanding more of their public school. Next one. Thank you. And so I'm going to focus my time on Angeles Workshop School, which is um, what my pri primary uh, work is in. Uh, we're about 10 years old. Next one. Uh, we do call it a revolutionary school, but my sense of it is maybe eventually people do get to call you that if, if you meet your goals, but you know, we're aspirational. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we are a micro school, always 30 students or less. That's the type of curriculum we practice. Next one. Okay. And I'm not going to actually read the philosophy, mission, or guiding principles. What I will say is what is on the left really comes out of humanist education and kind of psychosocial developmental aspects of developing self. Um, and so there are a lot of schools that do that and that can be good for just developing yourself. But um, we were interested in, uh, Sorry. oh no, it's all good. Uh, um, actual, again, critical consciousness raising education. And my partner and I, when we started the school, a group of parents pulled us together in a hall and they said, we no longer want to do what we are doing in our current school. I can share that story later. And they said, well, why don't you start a school? We said, uh, and they said, yeah, start a school. And now it's been almost 11 years. So that's what it is. And so over here is kind of um, the, the, the kind of critical liberatory and anti-colonial kind of philosophies and, and pedagogical ways that we've understood ourselves. And I didn't actually create any of these. Um, we've had a couple of dissertations come out of our school, a couple of studies. 
And so these actually came out of conversations with students and I kind of like thematically put it together. Uh, next one, please. Okay. And so some of what we do, because uh, I said, I'm gonna focus on that is um, we have teach-ins, we have a field trip every single Thursday, we take public transportation. And the idea is that you become deeply connected to your community and vice versa, have that dialectical kind of uh, relationship with also yourself and your community. And um, we have a process called self-assessment. I'll show, show it to you in a quick moment, but this is kind of what it is. And then instead of traditional kind of um, sex ed or life skills or uh, some of that framing that comes out of public school, we have a program kind of created by kids actually called Real Respectful Relationships. And we're able to apply that to all sorts of aspects of um, being a young person. Next one, please. Um, the school day is kind of divided into two guided sessions. Just think about it as being more of your traditional school day. Uh, I'm a science teacher. I started out as a scientist, and now I don't know what I am, but um, that's what kind of I am still, the science teacher. And action sessions are when you take on projects for yourself, and every afternoon you do it by yourself, you do it with people, or you find an instructor to help you do it. Um, and I'll show you examples in a quick minute. Thanks. Uh, humanities, we have a non-linear approach to it, so it's not a forward march through history from like the year zero to now and kind of hope you get to the Reagan years or something. It's none of that. Um, it is kind of um, based on these themes. Again, these emerged out of students, parents, and community. Um, and so it's, instead of, you don't, you don't have to cover every revolution, could these apply to one of them that you learn? And therefore, students should be able to apply these to um, other areas. Um, other areas. I'm cracking up because that's um, Asher, who's like now 22. Um, yeah, he's a very he's a sweet kid. And then uh, this was an assignment where they made their own island and they had to do their own governance. And it, 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 it got interesting. Um, anarchy is an interesting thing when you're 12. So like that's, that's what that was. Next one, please. <laughs> It's a good time. I'll talk to you about it later. And then these are some of the community initiatives that came out of um, student-led stuff. And so as someone who works with unhoused people when I'm not doing this, we started a giving shelf, has its own life now. It's take what you want, leave what you don't, that kind of thing. And it's become, um, we've since moved from this space and it's still thriving and doing its thing. We have a letter writing program with um, two incarcerated folks. And then all of these have emerged from within community and students themselves. Um, we also started not a community garden, but like growing crops in the space between the street and like our actual school. Part of it is students looked for permission of how to do this from the city perspective. And the city said, no, and they're just like, we, we're just gonna grow stuff. So we had tomatoes. The first thing they said, we we're like, we wanna grow all the components of salsa. I was like, Ooh. So anyway, that's what happened. And then it ended up being this huge block project because the neighbors next door and next door and next door just kind of kept adding vegetables. Um, I will say we did not grow enough vegetables to like sustain the, you know, <laughs> the block. <laughs> which was, again, the dream of, of, of students. But we could talk about the contradictions of that. But we do think like experiments in democracy are, are super important. Uh, next one. Okay. I'm not going to read what the self-assessment is. This comes from a body of literature, um, actually a couple bodies of literature, some indigenous knowledge system uh, literature, some of that humanistic ed that I talked about, which is the most important kind of type of assessment comes from within. And so these are the kind of three components that students grade themselves on, on every single aspect of whatever they do, whether it be written, so-called traditionally academic, or just kind of being cool to the kid next to you, right? So it's called our heart, mind, and ha hand model. And then you assign yourself a grade. Uh, people always ask, do they inflate their grades? The answer is no. Um, do the grades that they get match the ones they get in college? Yes, at this point, a bunch of them are graduate students kind of minding their business wherever they are. Um, but this process is has, we, has been really kind of valuable for all of us. Next one. And then of course, teachers give their own feedback. Um, just These are just photos of our city day. Next one. 
Um, this is a 12 year old Luke responding to the George Floyd uh, revolt and, and his sense of what we could do about it. So, and then we moved our entire school to the Discord server that the kids built. The, the, the minute we realized that we are um, now in a pandemic are not going to be face to face. Next one, please. Uh, this is one of my favorite friends and my tattoo artist who created Afropunk, uh, James Spooner and uh, Jordan, who now is a master's in art MFA student, was super interested. He, he was like, I want to know about this. So this is an example of experts and enthusiasts pulling local people and not just doctor, lawyer, or whatever career they used to be. Like, what are the people in our community? What do they do? Can they come here? Can we go there? And that's what that is. Next one, please. Um, here's an example of a role-playing game kind of made by a student during that time of calling action session that kind of um, was part of that uh, create your own island situation. Thank you. Next one. And then in another life, if we had nothing but time, I have all the joy of cosplaying a lot. And I do a lot of presentations at places like Comic-Con because a huge component of our school is role-playing games. So we have one that's built on the Old West. That's a social justice game. Um, I have a an African centered. We have like 10 or 11 giant role playing games that probably take the entire school year to play. And if I laid it all out, it would take about the, a quarter of the school. And this is, uh, we learn science, math, language, everything kind of uh, through this kind of gamification. A lot of literature around um, high experimentation and gamification, uh, particularly with students who are neurodivergent, you get to kind of tie out social interactions and your own political, but it's a safe way of, of, of trying out things um, at certain times, so yes. And then students also get to practice their other skills at City Day, and I think I just have one more, and then that'll be it for me. Uh, next one, please. Um, yeah, and so, um, this is uh, Joe Hempelman wrote this uh, a couple of years ago. Joe Hempelman now has a master's and is our uh, psychology teacher at workshop. So the sustainability piece for us, we have about three ex-students who are now, they're my colleagues. It's, it's really beautiful. Actually, to me, that's the most beautiful thing that has ever emerged out of, out of this experiment of joy. But um, yeah, so I, I again, I want to raise those contradictions again because maybe some of those, some of these are some of the questions you have as to like, what does this mean? And, and what does it matter beyond the 30 students that I work with? And that's something I think about all the time, but I'm happy to talk about that later. Thank you so much. And I hope I didn't overdo it. Um, can the folks on Zoom hear me? It just occurred to me, if you wanted to walk around, you could use the mic and walk around. But if I do that, that feedback thing, I just want to walk. It's okay, I'll, I'll wait here, sorry. Can people who hear me, can, can I get like a thumbs up or a, um, a yes or something from somebody else? No, okay, I'm gonna take my mask off. All right, let's go talk loud. All right, so um, yeah, I'm Kermit O, uh, as you might from Philly. Um, that's really the most important thing you know about me. Um, oh, for people in the room, I guess I'll zoom too. If I start talking too fast, do like some kind of gesture, tell me to slow down because I can easily be carried away. Um, and also like, you'll do it one time, but then I'll, and I'll slow down for like 10 seconds and then speed up again. So you might do it a few times, but <laughs> chill out. All right, so the gist of my uh, work here is around uh, community resilience building. And as, as I get into uh, my presentation, I'll talk about what that means. Um, but the, if I was gonna sum it up, it's like, you know, how do we, um, build, learn, and grow together now. Be better prepared for tomorrow. Okay. Um, context of Philly. Um, so I'm not going to read all this stuff, but uh, Philly is a you know sixth largest city in the, in the, in the uh, country, in the U.S. Um, but we are the um, uh, biggest poor city in, in the U.S., which means like 25 percent of our population is below the poverty line. Um, I'll talk more about that later. There's all kinds of issues with gun violence, uh, food apartheid, um, and a lot of this has to do with historical disinvestment, uh, redlining, if you're familiar with that. Um, and these, these lines, arbitrarily drawn and uh, uh, classified, um, has, have had after effects in terms of quality of life in different parts of the city, um, concentrated in the North and Southwest. Um, so my research focuses on my own neighborhood, which is Germantown, so with Northwest. Um, and um, 
Germantown is a place that um, has, like, as a whole, kind of large loss of poverty throughout the, throughout the area, um, but with variation throughout. And, um, uh, you know, that that term poverty refers to mostly income as far as the federal measurements is concerned, um, but doesn't consider uh, uh, differences in uh, cost of living, which is pretty high in Philly. Um, and uh, specifically with respect to food access, which is a particular focus of mine, uh, I'll talk more about that later. Um, you know, in Germantown, if you look at the map here, the darker areas correspond to uh, areas that have stores with fresh produce. Um, and the lighter it gets, the, you know, it's from uh, zero to 10%. Um, so uh, by and large, most of the, of the, of the neighborhood does not have access to fresh produce, right? So it's like packaged goods and stuff like that. And so what that tends to mean is that folks have to decide between uh, traveling far, right? So they're spending time and money to go far to get fresh produce or selling for private produce in their neighborhood. So it's a, it's a, a sort of a false choice. Um, so these relations of domination, as I call them, uh, which are inherent to capitalism, um, have any number of manifestations um, and um, they tend to fall disproportionately on people of color, working class or um, unhoused folks and so forth. Um, and um, these conditions, I would call, which are like daily, ongoing, persisting, um, I call them stressors, um, which are defined here long term structural dynamics that increase vulnerability and reduce potential, um, potential to thrive specifically. And then there are um, occasional uh, high impact of services to a system, whether it's economic, political, climatic, whatever, that we will call shots. Um, so when I'm thinking about resilience, I define it specifically as the capacity of communities in complex systems to learn, cope, adapt, and transform in the face of structures and shots. Um, but what's important here for me too is that this is not defined merely as just survival, but also the ability to thrive, right? In the everyday and then also moving towards the future. Um, and to thrive means the ability to move beyond the economic logic of scarcity to the material possibilities of cultivating abundance. Um, so my overarching research question is how might alternative social and economic relations at the scale of the city block mitigate persisting stressors and build resilience against inevitable shocks? And there's some sub questions there, which I, I'm going to just kind of, you know, kind of glance at them, but um, I'm dealing with stuff to do with the food, water, energy nexus, thinking about food, water, energy being essential, indispensable uh, resources, uh, also looking at the logic of the commons, um, and then how participatory methods can be deployed to help people cope with this space. Um, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, ripping off of what Denny said, with the folks with the mailbox is like, how do we own our space and do something, do what we want with it, right? They're like our needs. Uh, yeah. All right, so I meant, oh, I didn't mention this. Let me go back a little bit. So, um, so all the conditions in Philly, right, from like gentrification, redlining, toxic land use, all these different things are themselves essentially the colonial project. Right, and I just think that the time scale has been extended from like the sort of the immediacy of European invasion to this like slow death of precarity. Right, um, shout out to Rob Nixon for that term, slow, 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 death, slow violence. Um, so precarity is, is an interesting word, right? Um, defined officially as I think this is maybe the Oxford uh, dictionary, a uh, state of existence in which material provision and psychological wellness are adversely affected by a lack of security or stability. But what I find interesting about this word is the etymology of it. I love etymology. I love work and stuff. Anyway, so the, the etymology of it comes from precarious, which means obtained by asking or praying or dependent on the will of another, right? Which to me represents the relationship between people and the state. Um, so my hypothesis is that resilience requires decision making power at the level of self determination over key things like land use, labor resources, across the means of both production and exchange. Um, so this is particularly important in Philly, uh, where democratic machine politics um, uh, cemented, cemented that party's dominance, um, and the officials in turn have unaccountable power uh, from the district levels to the mayor's office, including a near feudal authority over land use. Uh, specifically, there's a, a thing called, it's not just in Philly, but Chicago as well, other places, uh, called councilmanic prerogative. And what it essentially means is that uh, a council person um, can pass uh, a bill that governs some kind of land use decision, whether to build an arena or to, uh, I don't know, destroy a park or whatever, and automatically, every other council person unanimously will agree with that thing because when it's their turn, they don't want anybody to go against them thing. So they kind of just flat hand the green like, hey, if you want to do something with your land, we'll, we'll, we'll go along with you, right? And because it's unanimous, it's even above the mayor's veto power. So it's like a complete dominance over, over land use, right? Um, and so you can imagine, you know, with these folks like being funded by real estate developers, when it comes to like, oh, should we do a community garden? Should we do a new three story car, car company for the parking lot? 
who's giving them the, the, the campaign donation that decides what, what actually happens, right? So it's really gross. Um, and these folks, um, they're kind of unaccountable because they, there are all these mechanisms in which they can't actually be defeated. So like I think of in the last election, um, eight out of, let me see, uh, eight out of the 10 district council people ran unopposed and the two that didn't win were, were incumbents. So like, it's almost impossible to even challenge them. So what incentive do they have to do what people want when there's no way they can actually lose their seat? Um, yeah, um, so the donkeys there are just to show that they're members of the Democratic Party, not in any way meant to infer that they're, that they're jackasses. <laughs> um, so the other thing is that, you know, Philadelphia's crisis of misrepresentation is kind of twofold. So there's the, what I just mentioned about the absence of accountability, and there's also this deeply entrenched process of identity, right? So this idea that like, oh, if we have black leaders, that should mean something, right, for black people, but it hasn't actually panned out, right? And there's no more um, egregious example of the disconnect between racial representation and power than something that happened in Philly in 1985, which was where uh, the, the city police dropped a C4 bomb on uh, a neighborhood on a house and it spread and destroyed an entire city block, killed 11 people, including five kids. Um, and it was a black mayor that oversaw that project. So yeah, racial representation, nonsense. Um, and you know, what's really gross about this story, if you're not familiar with it, is that the initial explosion uh, caught the fire and it took a long time for the fire to spread. And then he told the fire department to not put it out, just wait, let it burn. Um, and it said, as people were just dying, they, just, they could have stopped it, but they just let them die slowly. So, I mean, just like, you, you can't even think of a better example of just absolute contempt uh, from, a, from a city government towards their, their own people. Okay. Um, so this is the context in which I, I think that I decided to situate my work at the level of the city block. Um, the reason being that I think that uh, the city block is the largest scale within this urban context at which collective decision making is feasible before it gives way to that positive representation. So there's no city block official, right? So if we're deciding things on the level of the block, then we there's no way to decide for us. We gotta do it, we gotta do it ourselves, right? Um, and yeah. And it's also large enough that like it's more meaningful than uh, than just a single house. Um, so just yeah, gave more to that easy place. So my work looks at three pillars, one of which is the food, water, energy nexus, which comes out of the UN sustainable development goals, which you know um miss me with most of that. Like I, I kind of know why I said it, but I do think the framing of understanding the linkages between food, water, and energy is, is instructive and important, right? That they all do connect in a particular way. Um so when I look at the literature though, some of the, the gaps are around the fact that um after we research to look at like really big global scale and like big issues of sustainability, like really technical stuff like that, which regular folks on the block aren't really thinking about or even know about, right? So that's not the disconnect there. Um, so as to how it applies to the everyday people, the everyday way people live, um, there's, a, there's a missing part there. Um, there's also missing stuff around how people collaborate either across scales or across sectors and silos, right? So if you are a geographer, like, well, I'm not a geographer yet, but I'm a geography student, um, or you are a um, policymaker, or you're a, a university professor, or you're an activist, whatever, there's a there's nothing in the literature that talks about how folks can engage with this nexus across these different silos, right? Um, and then, oh yeah, the other thing that literature shows is that there's a real need for uh, participation in particular methods will be employed for people to engage in a way that um, are missing, right? So I'll get to that in a minute too. So, saying? Yeah. All right. Um, so the other, the other color of my work is solidarity uh, economy, which you want to talk a bit about. Um, so uh, this term describes the social material conditions in which people work together, sharing space, time, and resources through relations of exchange that quote, promote social solidarity, mutual aid, reciprocity, and generosity. Uh, however, building a solidarity economy also requires a certain political solidarity, which may be long in coming due to long and deeply embedded tensions which bubble up from the country's foundation as a settler colony, a slave state, and Philadelphia's own history of, of racial conflict. Uh, Philadelphia, as said, is a city of neighborhoods, um, which essentially means, I don't like that, okay. Um, uh, so there's various enclosures with economic geographic effective, um, which are permeable to material flow. So resources move really easily, but people not so much, right? Whether it's migration, whether it's displacement, like there's people are really kind of stuck and, and don't really have control over uh, how they move. 
Um, I can say more about the sort of pattern of itinerancy in the city and how people are not able, able to be rooted because of uh, patterns of displacement and, and development and so forth. Um, so there's also, so um, the segregation that kind of is the fact that on Philly, uh, it's not just a physical thing, but uh, as George Lipschitz talks about, um, there's this sort of divergence between spatial, uh, spatial imaginary, black and white, um, and he kind of character and this, this, this divergence is characterized most prominently by uh, the difference between use over exchange value. Um, so within the black spatial imaginary, and this is to be clear, like this is not all black people think this way, all white people think this way. That's not that's not real. Um, but there are there is a general thrust within black culture that that where this is true, and within quote unquote white culture, this is true. Um, and so yeah, use value in black imaginary use value is more important than exchange value. Which has to do in part to accessing capital, right? The ability to even navigate that system. So we, we create what we use as a book because we're not going to access this market. Anyway, um, so tell over selfishness, inclusion over exclusion, and more important is what one is able to offer as opposed to what one uh, owns or occupies. So on the other hand, here, um, more focus on exchange value, private ownership, and what people own. So um, the solidarity economy, where open space for political solidarity. Uh, see emerging possibilities for reciprocal, mutually beneficial exchange across divides of race, class, ability, and generation. The realization of this vision requires access to real political participation. participation. So what do I mean by that? Um, you People it may have seen this before. This is Sherry Arnstein's relatively famous ladder participation, um, where she kind of talks about, um, from 1969, talks about the different level, different ways that people can participate, whether it's in government and research projects and whatever. I mean, she was writing from policy uh, Position. So um, it's more about government um, relationships, um, but it goes from manipulation all the way to system control. And what I've done is I kind of juxtapose this ladder with a scale from objectification to subjectivity, which uh, deals with, uh, you, you can look at this in terms of uh, a research engagement with community or with, even if with activists engagement with community, right? So like sometimes activists come in like, hey, we're going to do what's best for you. We're going to, we're going to mobilize you the way we want to mobilize you. We're not going to ask you what you want to do. Or you recognize the ways in which you resist that aren't even registering as resistance right for us. So uh, people kind of oppose their political program and people, even when they mean what's best for them or whatever. So anyway, um, so kind of, if you just go to two things, you kind of, I kind of chart this parallel uh, uh, donation of power from exploitation all the way up to self-determination, which is my ideal, right? So people uh, controlling for themselves, their own resources, their own governance, and like, you know, uh, pay anarchy. Um, yeah, that's what, it's, <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Um, okay, so, the, the, so that's the, uh, kind of the um, theoretical framework that I'm dealing with, but you may be wondering, well, how does, what does that look like? How do you actually do that in a truly authentic way? So I created this tool called the Body Ecological Compass, which I'm not going to talk about now because we're going to actually do this in the room and on Zoom. Um, so you can do the experiment with it for yourself. Um, but um, so I'm going to pass it on to Alice to talk about her work and then we'll get into that. <laughs> oh, well. Yes, but okay. Oh, okay. What? Sorry, I wasn't quite done. One more. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Let's go back to this. Yeah. Um, so um, this this using these methods and co-production basically what's important here is sharing knowledge, power, and resources. Um, and what I want to say is that organizing the local block, while it might not the actual community is political in the obvious sense in terms of engaging with the state. Um, they're political for the fact that they secure community control of means of production and exchange, right? So if you can control um, your own resources, that is inherently political. That's about right? Um, but also, because these operations require control of land, right? Um, like we create a community garden on an unknown space, um, inevitably you're going to, and this has, tends to be extra legal, inevitably you're going to contend with legal structures like zoning or you know, different economic accounts of the state. Um, and so uh, where that happens and where these encounters infringe upon people's self determination, I feel like they're more inclined to organize their own self-defense, right? So rather than organizing abstractly, hey, we should mobilize to do this thing, it's like, no, we're going to do a community garden with speed people, and then when they come for that, we're going to stand up against that, as opposed to this abstract idea of, of, of resistance. Um, and so um, there's just a few different things that the framework will help facilitate. I didn't run out of time here, um, and I'll talk more about all this stuff. Uh, oh, God, how much time? I don't know. No, this is a okay, I do have, I have like two minutes. There. Yeah. So just really quickly, this is just like some actual examples of what can happen. So I will say disclaimer that this framing of like water energy and like what I hope to do on my own block is my idea. So I might talk to my neighbors and they were like, actually, all we want to do is build a whole network of mosquito zappers. In which case that's what we'll do, right? But I'm hoping, hoping that we can just make joke like this, you know, but we'll see. Anyway, so like things like, 
you know, creating community gardens and making lots, um, even doing backyard gardens where, it, it, let's say, an individual uh, has yard space, but they don't want to, don't know how to want to garden themselves. Maybe one person on the block who was like a steward was like, hey, I want to tend to your backyard space myself, and we can basically donate your produce for your garden into the general, into the commons, right? Um, and then on the water piece, it's a few different things about like, you know, planting trees strategically to uh, mitigate flooding, um, uh, also for shade, um, uh, improving air quality, uh, cooling blocks, uh, areas that have urban heat on effects, um, but also rainwater catchment um, to uh, it, it, purification to have a source of fresh water. Of crisis. We had a, a chemical spill a year ago. Um, so there obviously people went to their grocery store to get bottled water, but like if we had a normal practice of like searching our own water from the rain, then when a crisis happens, we would still be getting our water from the same place. So it's an easy kind of shift as opposed to uh, adapting in a, in a crisis, right? Which is difficult. Uh, energy, real quick, some ideas. Um, you know, uh, incorporating a rooftop solar into a collective plan. Um, you have this, you know, a solar panels on a, on a shed in the, in the uh, food forest to, uh, you know, power the tools. Um, and then this uh, all kind of ancillary ecosystem services, quote unquote, and uh, ecological benefits, which I'm not going to read through. I think you'd like 10 seconds to kind of just glance at a few of those possibilities. Um, and um, that's you know, that's some of the things that could possibly happen all at the block scale, which I you know, hope to do. Um, now I'm actually done. All right. Allison, are you going to sit there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. I'm just going to adjust this so that it shows you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Chopeg. I'm a Municipalism Learning Series Fellow. Uh, I want to say I'm super impressed and excited about the work that you all are doing. So thank you for sharing for what you're doing. Um, it's been a real honor to be a part of this um, fellowship. And I'm here in um, substitution for another fellow of ours who's named Zacharias, who wasn't able to come, but he was going to talk about Survival Block, which is a really great initiative that he and his partner and other comrades are involved in. So if you want to learn more about it, you can use the QR code to check out this video and then contact them and get involved. It's a really amazing initiative led by young people around mitigation and uh, survival through climate change. Um, but unfortunately, that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I want to talk about the natural and artificial commons in Puerto Rico. Um, I'll start out again with a little bit of geography, just the tip of the iceberg, geographic context about post Maria Puerto Rico. And then I'll jump into two examples looking at the two guises of the commons, the artificial and the natural, and the ecotone between them. And then I'll conclude with a question and hopefully in time for us to move on to the questions and the activity and do more of that fun stuff together. Um, so in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria, the one of the two category five hurricanes that hit in 2017, was very catastrophic, is often referred to as the teacher. Um, so instead of saying, from my words, I will quote uh, the Puerto Rican poet Aurora Levin Morales um, to explain what that means. She said, <clears throat> she wrote, we are a people in a land adapted to surviving hurricanes, natural and social. We know that the broken makes way for the new and at the eye of each storm, there's a circle of calm, a place from which to see clear and far. And the picture behind this, I think, is a great demonstration of that. That's the summer uprising of 2019, a couple years after the hurricanes hit, but they, it was really a pathway to that uprising in which the people came out and fired their governor and their leaders and cabinets because they recognized that they were very corrupt and also contempt had added, expressed attitudes of contempt towards the people. And so, um, it wasn't the recovery process that created that, but it was that which helped the people to uncover it and, and realize it and stand up against it. And the other thing that I think is important to know about Post Maria Puerto Rico is that um, while the, the poly crises that we often talk about are impacting the whole world, the current impacts of two of the main drivers, climate change and social inequality, are very concentrated in Puerto Rico, as you can see the last um, two decades it was measured, we have the time, highest climate risk index and the highest um, economic inequality according to the geo Gini coefficient in the Western Hemisphere, something like the sixth or seventh highest in the world. Um, and so because these impacts are very concentrated in a way, it's like we're living in the future that's spreading 
to the rest of the world through these drivers. So I think that there's a lot to be learned about um, how we are living in that future and thinking about living in it. And speaking about futures, that requires reimagining society, and that's essentially what we're supposed to be up to at the School of Planning and Indian Planning Endeavors. Um, so I'm gonna turn to Michael Hart, who wrote in The Politics of the Common, and he said, struggling over the common and inventing alternative means to manage it are fundamental for any project to reimagine society today. And he divides the common into the two guises, the natural common referring to the earth and all of its ecosystems and forms of life that interact with them, and the artificial common, which refers to the products of human labor, immaterial production, creativity, et cetera, that includes, of course, art and culture. So I use the term ecotone um, between these natural and artificial commons. The ecotone is a transition area between two ecosystems where they meet and integrate. So it's much more than just a boundary or a relationship. It's really a mixing of the two. So the first example um, is called, uh, it's a housing cooperative centered in queer and artistic communities. It's called La Cultura Tresario. And it's located in the San Jose Arts District of the capital of San Juan. In an, area called, in an area called Barrio Machu Chao that as far as we know was first settled by Maroon communities who were escaping enslavement to go live in what was at that time a, a mangrove. And since then their descendants and other people have moved in have mostly been Afro descendants and people of color that have been systematically, systemically abandoned and marginalized by the state in what so often happens in, all across racial capitalism. Um, which then led to devaluation of the land. And that devaluation of the land then meant that the area was financially accessible to artists who labor is often steeply undervalued, and especially public artists. Thank you for that um, distinction, Bimby. Um, art and, and artists who engage in activism and remaking the future. And so they congregated there and they began co-producing artificial commons of art and culture through their immaterial production and the place-based nature of the work that they were engaged in in turn increased the capital value of the land, turning it into what is now known as the arts, arts district, attracting capitalists to speculate and extract and build up the visitor economy, the tourist economy, and thereby driving the, play, the prices of the land up and displacing those very people whose labor spurred the value increase in the first place. And so this group that I mentioned is a collective of people who are centered in the artistic and queer communities who are really seeking ways to recollectivize land tenure as a way to reclaim accessibility to the natural common of the land that they need to continue with their co-production production of the artificial common, not just art, but also active activism around these, these questions. And so um, I'm, and some of my, I have a, I'm part of a team of four co-researchers who are accompanying them in this exploration. And we're at the beginning stage, we are negotiating property rights or rather the lack thereof to ensure that our immaterial production of this knowledge will not be deteriorated by property relations as Michael Hart points out in his article, almost always happens in both guises of the common. And so we're essentially negotiating non-ownership based on the reality that knowledge is co-created and should not be owned by any individual party necessarily. Um, I wanted to give you all an opportunity to learn more about them if you're interested. Unfortunately, the only presence that I know that they have on the web is this podcast, which is in Spanish. So if you understand Spanish, please take this QR code and learn more about um, them and their work and you know, we'll have uh, future papers and things coming out in the future. So I'm gonna move on to the second example, which is um, called a uh, term coined by my colleague, Dr. Arián Torres Cordero at the University of Puerto Rico Graduate School of Planning. And he wrote about what he called bomba planning, which is an anti-colonial and solidarity based practice. And I think that what this can tell us about the ecotone between the artificial and natural commons is the other side of what we learned from the housing cooperative where we know that the natural common is really uh, in, essential for production of the artificial common. The other way around, part of immaterial production that we must bolster and invest in is the immaterial knowledge, skills, rules, and processes 
to make decisions together to manage all commons and plan into the future, and in particular, collective governance of natural commons. And so he wrote in his article that their job, he, he looked at three case studies of people that were planning in different parts of Puerto Rico in recovery and reimagining re -imagining recovery in the face of state abandonment. So if you know anything about the recovery process, the official recovery process has been kind of a disaster upon disaster. And so many you know, people in Puerto Rico have um, taken up the recovery on their own. And he did a case study of three of them. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it, but he did find that their driving force for all of them was to advocate for and advance new participatory governance models that give citizens direct power to man imagine, plan, and build the changes they desire for the community. And the other piece that was really beautiful about the, this term that he coined is that Bompa is itself an artificial common in, the, in that term. It's um, a music, dance, and now planning and resistance. Um, and it's really always been a resistance movement since its um, inception. And it's always created space for communal gathering, exchange, and imagining, which of course are necessary for long-term future visioning, collective visioning, long, medium, and short-term planning as well. Um, so it's kind of, in a way, it's an echo tone between our, an artificial commons, which we identify as art and culture, and one which we identify as um, activism or decision-making. Um, and it's become so, because Bomba has become over generations so embedded as a way of being and relating that communities reflect its patterns and customs and other areas of life, such as the, the visioning for the future and multi-scale planning at different temporal scales. Um, it's a wonderful article, highly encourage you to read it. You can use the QR code to find it here. So I will conclude so that we can move on to the question and answer and the wonderful activity that Kermit has prepared for us. But I do want to conclude with a question. And I put conclusion beginning because I'm hoping that this presentation, you know, is the same thing, but that the question maybe opens up new ways of thinking for us. And appropriately, I was at an arts festival recently, and a big thing that folks were thinking about and talking about was this idea of a knowledge, a nostalgia for the future. And so I'm really curious and thinking about how can we develop a nostalgia for the future, a future where we reclaim the joy of collectively stewarding commons, both artificial and natural. And I think this nostalgia piece brings more than just skills and processes and knowledge because it starts to bring the feeling, the gut, the affect, the motivation, um, which is something that is sorely needed to engage in this kind of work together because it's so hard collective governance and making decisions um, together is, is messy. It's not easy. It could be fun and joyful, but it's definitely not easy. It can be quite chaotic. Oh, and there's my contact information. It doesn't show up very well. That's another example of uh, a mural that was painted um, in the last Santor CSLA festival. There's a mural art festival in the district, uh, one of my favorites. And then, um, if I have time, I just want to conclude with the words of another fellow from our municipal or municipalism learning series fellow, Georgie Garza, um, translated the book Constructing Worlds Otherwise. And um, he wrote the recent decision, or his translation reads, the recent decisions the Zapatistas have made keep this long horizon in mind. As they state, we have to fight for someone we are not going to know to make it possible for these new generations to be truly free and to take charge of the decisions they make, that is the authors of their own freedom. They bet on the need, the name of a Mayan girl to be born in 120 years time, to not only survive the ongoing storm, but to go through this and other storms that will come. It's about surviving the night and reaching that morning, 120 years from now, where a girl begins to learn that being free is also being responsible for that freedom. Thank you. All right, that's it for me again. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier how you know uh, it's really important. I uh, think this idea of agency, is determination, and participation has been kind of running through all our all our presentations. And so we're going to have you guys do. I wish there was, I mean, you have notebooks and stuff, so you can use those. If people want to see them, you can use um, just this on the screen. Um, this is a framework that I created called the Five Ecological Habits. Five dimensions because there's three dimensions of physical space, 
Uh, fourth dimension is time, and then the fifth is social state, right? Um, essentially, what it is is like thinking about um, the relationship between a particular thing, the area of focus, which for this group will be the commons, um, and at the end of time. Oh, um, yeah, okay. Um, so thinking about relationship between um, the thing of focus, like it could be food, it could be water, it could be energy, it could be the commons, whatever, and social, right? And, and, and the people, right? Um, and that's also across the scale of time. So we're going to be talking about the relationship, the relationship in the past, the relationship in the future, right? Or we're talking about relationship to that thing, right? And the physical environment. Um, in the past or in the future. So these four things are just kind of like thematic names for what I'm talking about. So we're talking about the future of, so of social, that's like a dreaming, we're talking about the past of the social, we're going to talk about like, the memory, um, which is different than history. Um, and then uh, we're talking about the past of the environment, talking about embedded history. So like what is what um, uh, scars, changes are embedded in the land that we can look at. And then we think about the future of the, of the environment, how we shape it, how it shapes us, um, that's world making, right? So, um, keep hitting the keyboard, it's doing it again. Um, so then, um, if you generate questions, so the idea here, remember, again, is like I was saying that when you do contemporary research, oftentimes the researchers are still imposing their own questions on, on community, right? So, this is a framework to get folks to generate their own questions, right? So, I have no research agenda. I'm going to say, like, hey, this is a framework you can use, create your own questions based on what your priorities are, what you want to know. Um, so, as you generate questions, you can think also about how these relationships between a thing and the environment, a thing and people at different scales is mediated by these three forces. So power, and if you define however you want, materiality, so the physical aspect of land, resources, and so forth, and then also affects so the emotional part of it. So, well, you know, and I get into um, some examples in a second. Um, so the folks online will get you good in the breakout rooms in a minute. Um, I think you'll be the self-select into uh, uh, rooms based on quadrant. So the framework also looks at scale, right? So you might be thinking about these questions in terms of the scale of just your own self, you know, your, your household, your block, your neighborhood, your city, your region, your country, the globe, whatever, right? Which creates a new set of questions. The idea here is that based on sort of navigating different ideas of relationships, uh, mediations of the relationships at different scales, the potential questions are virtually infinite, right? But it all comes stems from your own interests. Um, that's just a visualization of, you know, if we're going to visualize, uh, uh, like, sort of the charting the different questions that people ask them based on where they were socially, physically, so forth, things like that. Okay, so really quickly, so for this group and for you online, let's take comments, that's the theme of the workshop, right, as our reference point, right? And you guys in your, uh, so there's probably anybody here, but individually or in your group, you guys actually want to come to one table, I maybe go, um, to start thinking about what questions do you have about the relationship between comments and to society or relationships in common than the past, like what, was, what it looked like previously, right? And so forth. So just as some thematic examples, if, you, if you're totally confused, um, if I'm looking at the future of social, right? This is drawing on Ivan's presentation, right? I might think, okay, so what role might comedy play providing a material basis for dual power, right? So that's a question that I might generate, or Ivan might generate based on her work. But I'm not saying to answer that question, I'm saying like, you create your own question based on that idea of relationship between comments and future of society. Right. Then if we're looking at the bottom right quadrant, um, you even I think you moved that thing out of the way. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So this is drawn on Jenny's presentation. You might, you might think, okay, well, well how are this is coming back to sustain generationally against the colonial ratios? So about education, right? Passing on different ideas, how they maintain those practices that, that you know against the colonial ratios. So that's a question you might ask, right? Um, and then looking at drawing upon um I'll get one back control side. Drawing on. My presentation, I might ask a question like, how have historical patterns of development foreclosed the current crisis of common economy? So, how the physical environment and how it changed actually prevented from people from common, right? Or, and looking at finally Alton's presentation, how might that nostalgia for the future shape the regeneration of the natural commons? So, you can see all the questions deal with the commons, right? And they deal with relationships between the commons and people, past or future, or environment. Um, past and future, and you notice that the two spheres overlap because, like, Alice talks about the ecotone, right? Those two things are not uh, uh, distinct. So, I've given you kind of a hefty charge here, but um, <laughs> do your best. There's no wrong answer. That's the great thing about it. So, go ahead. Okay. And uh, for people online, uh, uh, if I'm working on creating the questions, 
you guys can start uh, thinking through it, talking through it um, on, your, on, on your own, and then we'll come back. I guess maybe like it, maybe 10 minutes or so, and then um, debrief. So just to be clear, it's not necessarily answering these questions. Right, it's right. Developing, developing the questions. Right. Yeah. Questions. If you were going to do this process for real, I mean, the question generation process would take some time, and then you might get the work of answering eventually. But the point is not really to answer them per se; it's to ask the question. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this might lead to um, actually you need to say. So let's say you're asking a question about the past, and nobody in the group knows the answer. It's like, oh, actually, we don't know. So let's tap, you know, Ms. So and so, who's elder on the block, she might know the answer to that question. So we got to reach out to her. So that's a, a reason for, let's say, young people talk to elders because they have knowledge that they don't have. So here's who we have to talk to, right? Or let's say it's about something we want to do. Oh, we want to build X, Y, Z. Oh, I don't know how to do that. Okay, well, we're going to find somebody to apprentice us. So who do we call in? Like, Dindy calling in the guy who did the um, Afropunk. Afropunk, right? Like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to do this thing. So can I call him in to apprentice us, help us do this activity? So it's not, it's a very dynamic process. That's the idea of it. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay. We should maybe Kermit. Could you? There's only one table, yeah. so we should all just go to that table. I might stay here to help with this. Sounds yeah. good. Um, but um, I am curious if folks on the Zoom understand what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I have uh, okay. So wait, just ignore me. Pretend I'm not here. So you guys do what you need to do. Um, but they do need to see. They do need to see the like, image. I know. I'm going to go back to it. I'm just trying to adjust. I have it. Up, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So you know, you could also show it on your laptop, uh, Kermit. Okay. So nobody understands what's happening on Zoom. Okay. So basically, Kermit is saying essentially, yeah. if I will, but I'm going to channel Kermit right now. Um. Yes. Yeah. So you guys are basically. We see there's breakout rooms that are open. Okay, Mason. Mason, why don't you explain it? Uh, Mason, you explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, we, we have eight breakout rooms, and they each there's two each that correspond to one of the questions on the screen, and um, all uh, 38 of you, or how many there are, can um, self select into those and have your discussion from there. Okay. Um, right. Thank you, Mason. So um, there is a breakout. There are two breakout rooms on world making. So if you are interested in the intersection of the environmental uh, and the future, you should go into either world making room one or the other world, world making uh, thing. Um, the other room eight. If you are interested in the intersection, okay, so if you're driving, don't 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 do a breakout. Um, if you are interested in the intersection of the future and collective dreaming in the social sphere, you should join either room two or room six, depending on um, you know how many people are there. Um, if you are interested in the past um, and sort of um, questions around sociality in the past and collective memory, you should join either room three or uh, room seven. Um, if you are interested in um, the questions of the past in terms of our environment and embedded history, you should join um, groups um four or um four i think that's four and uh yeah okay you know i also think that at some point honestly it won't matter what room you join you should just join a room <laughs> just join a room introduce yourself you know get to know each other we're only going to be there for like maybe like you know at this point eight minutes just join a room. If you don't end up joining a room, like if you're driving, um, yes, eight is supposed to be history. So uh, I'm going to start assigning people to rooms if you don't join them. Uh, actually, Mason, do you have that capacity to do that as well? To assign people? Uh huh. Yeah, I can. Okay, yeah, let's start doing that so that folks start to join meetings. Uh, start, jo sorry, join rooms. moving. 